So uh, we were talking about the biceps the other day, and we stopped here uh, where we can uh, grade MR changes of the biceps. And uh, there are a number of different ways to, to, to grade biceps injury. I'll go through some of them. I think from, a, from an imaging standpoint, uh, don't memorize this. <laughs> This is mo mostly for educational purposes, but I think we can divide up really up into eight uh, abnormal grades associated with, well, with biceps disease, starting from zero up through seven. Uh, zero would be, and I'll go through what these look like on an MR examination, but I strongly recommend you, you not use grade 52 in a, in a report. Just describe the findings. Uh, because there are different grades, diff people use different grading systems, and I think it gets very confusing uh, if, if you use grades like this. So let me go forward here. So here we go. Uh, so a little bit of the history of uh, biceps instability. Uh, one uh, grading system from 2004 by Habermeyer, which is commonly used in orthopedics, you have biceps instability instability that's grade one through four. Uh, type one is a superior glenohumeral ligament tear where you get a perched biceps. Type two is superior glenohumeral ligament tear with a supraspinatus tear in the region of the biceps. Uh, three, super, superior glenohumeral tear with a subscap tear. And then type four is where, where all of these structures are, are torn. And types three and four are associated with inf inferior risk of anterior superior impingement uh, because uh, it really uh, in involves a subscapularis tear. So uh, if you use this classification, excuse me. Uh, uh, this is just a diagram from the literature from Nakata, uh, which kind of shows locations of, of the tear. So when we start looking at uh, injuries, when we get around the, the biceps tendon, uh, remember to try to look for the supraspinatus and the subscap insertions and, and see if they're involved. Uh, so this is a, not a great image with a lot of motion artifact, but I I'm left this in just as to, to make a point that we can actually, even if we have a degraded image, we can often get a lot of information from the image. So we're, here we have a biceps tendon that's a little bit flattened. It's in the intertuberous groove uh, in this particular location. But here we can see there's actually a partial tear going into the subscapularis tendon here. And uh, the vast majority of biceps injury and, sub and subluxations uh, involved uh, tears of the subscap insertion at this location. And typically the biceps can, as we'll see in a minute, can dislocate into two areas. It can dislocate deep to the subscapularis tendon, cut through the, the joint side fibers, and end up in the joint space. That's where about 80% of dislocated biceps tendons occur. Or it can actually tear through the superficial fibers, either on the supraspinatus uh, side or on the subscap side, and end up anterior to the subscapularis tendon in this location. And that's only about 20% uh, of dislocations. And this was a little bit of an enigma back in the late 1980s when we were first doing MR scan of the shoulder because uh, some of the early cases we saw, we saw a biceps tendon displaced into the joint space. The overlying subscapularis tendon looked intact. So it was a little bit of an enigma at first as to how the biceps tendon could, could dislocate into the joint space with an intact subscapularis tendon. And then uh, what, as I'll show in a minute, uh, early on, we actually found some cases where we found the biceps trapped in the subscapularis tendon, and that made us realize that what happens is the tendon subluxes here, uh, either the subluxing biceps tendon or a partial tear of the joint side surface of the subscapularis tendon or both in tandem occur, and you get a tear of the deep fibers with displacement of the biceps tendon most of the time. So this is mentally displaced, so this would really be a type zero. Here is what we can see on the oblique sagittal images. If you remember the anatomy we talked about, here's where the superior glenohumeral ligament sits. And in this case, we have abnormal signal with increased signal intensity and abnormal morphology of the, uh, the uh, 
uh, superior glenohumeral ligament. So this was a, this I, I like to call it type zero, where we don't have really significant displacement at this time, but we actually have a partial tear of the superior glenohumeral ligament in this location without displacement. So the corticohumeral ligament is intact, but there's an abnormal superior glenohumeral ligament. And that's really best visualized on the oblique sagittal images. And so this would be a Habermeyer three, uh, but by MR criteria, uh, I consider this kind of a grade zero. But again, don't remember the grades, just remember to look for the different findings. So here's a 60 year old radiologist who presents with a cuff tear uh, and no anterior pain. Here we can see the biceps tendon here, the subscap looks fine. This was on 423.03. Uh, let's see, uh, Jeff, why don't you take this? So here it is on uh, 428.03. Here we have on 3909. So six years later, the patient developed acute anterior pain during push ups. And, and what happened? And, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Go ahead. No, so uh, yeah, so on the on the right it looks like a P fat set uh, image there, and now I'm looking at first thing I'm looking at is the position of the uh, biceps tendon within the occipital groove, and it looks like that the tendon has uh, looks like it's uh, perched now on the uh, lesser tuberosity. So so, yeah. so so here it's a little bit anterior, but I would not call this abnormal. Here it's clearly abnormal, where you can see part of the tendon is extending out of the intertuberous groove which would be defined by a line right across here, uh, right across the anterior cortex for those who can't see the cursor. And then you can see, therefore, the biceps tendon extends outside of the intertuberous groove, and obviously the morphology has changed. And, and what else do you see here, Jeff? Uh, it looks like now we have a, uh, either an interstitial or articular of the, super, of the subscapularis tendon as well. Yeah. So, so now we actually have a partial tear of the subscapularis tendon, which wasn't there before. So now we're actually going from what was a pretty normal exam here to one where we're starting to see the changes that we've been talking about. Uh, uh, Jeff? Yes. Uh, would this happen if the arm was at the patient's side all the time and never abducted? Or externally, uh, or externally rotated. So, okay, you're, so you're asking me, would we see this pathology if this arm was never externally rotated? Uh, or abducted. Or ever abducted. Um, Both. So, okay, so you're talking about in, just in terms of imaging the patient then? Uh, what, I'm trying like to, uh, what I'm trying to get to is, these uh, do not occur um, in a patient that doesn't actively abduct and an external, external rotate the arm. In other words, these these are usually pretty active people uh, that okay. do over overhead things with their arms. So, uh, I see. if you crochet, if you, all you do is crochet and stuff like that, this isn't going to happen. You, you're never going to get inter like a partial tear of your subscap then. Or is it, or is it, or is it going to be that uh, 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 you're never going to see the dislocation of the of, of the biceps tendon? Right. This needs attention and 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 continuous rubbing. I see. Gotcha. Thanks. Okay. So here we can see the changes in the tendon and the associated injury to the subscapularis insertion. And uh, now, and this would be kind of a type one. This would be a perched biceps, and kind of the terminology. So with the perched biceps, you you have an injury to the transverse ligament, which is the ligament which uh, helps keep the biceps tendon into the intertuberous groove, and typically that's associated with a, a small injury to the subscamp insertion. So this would be type one. Yes. When you have that perched appearance, when you have that perched appearance and that biceps look like a duck, you know, it's not that normal oval shape. Does that constitute as a partial tear then, or is it just, the biceps tendon? yeah. Uh, well, it's certainly an abnormal biceps tendon. I, I don't call those partial tears. I, I, uh, I call them uh, tendinosis of the biceps tendon uh, with perching, anterior perching, and then I would talk about a small partial tear of the deep fibers of the subscapularis or the interstitial fibers of the attachment of the subscapularis. Uh, so, Deshali, what do you think of this case? So, uh, 
axial T1 weighted image and a patient who's had an arthrogram. And the biceps tendon is flattened and there's ebernation of the lesser tuberosity and then there's also a large intrasubstance uh, tear of the subscapularis tendon. So, so, so this, is, this is more of a chronic case. And the other thing you notice here is the bone is abnormal. The, the actually intertuberous groove has been remodeled here. So this is a very chronic lesion that's actually uh, allowed uh, bony remodeling. We can see the interstitial tear. This is a bigger one in the subscap. In this case, we have a little bit of thickening of the transverse ligament uh, going over the top. But that's, again, a perched biceps. Uh, see, Noah, what do you think of this case? Yes, well, we've got a 56-year-old male with acute worsening of uh, chronic anterior shoulder pain, a uh, single axial image, um, and kind of like that last case, we're seeing sort of the perching of the uh, biceps tendon and uh, osseous remodeling to yep. go with it. So, a lot of osseous tricking. remodeling here, right? Mm -hmm. So it looks like sort of a chronic uh, type injury based upon uh, that. Um, let's see, that we've got some bristle yeah. too. Okay, can you see the cursor today? I can, yes. Oh, okay, yes. good. And then, so what's the cursor pointing out? Um, so, probably uh, some partial tearing of the uh, subscap to go with it, especially sure. that. So again, I think area. this is an interstitial care of the subscap, subscap, so we're seeing a lot of those things. In this case, we've got remodeling of the intertuberous groove. The biceps tendon in this case is still inside the groove. Now, it, it may be inside the groove at the positioning where we have the patient in the scanner, but if the patient actually went out and started doing some of John's exercises, it could very well pop into the subscapularis tendon. So, so often uh, when you see these interstitial tears, uh, it quite frequently, dynamically, the tendon is popping in and out of the intertuberous groove. It's just that often when we see it on MR because of the way we position the patient, we're more likely to catch it in the groove. So these interstitial tears are important because they typically signify that you've got an unstable biceps. And uh, what? it tends to be very symptomatic when it's subluxus. Yes, John? What is the, uh, what is the cavity adjacent uh, to uh, the biceps tendon? Are you asking me or asking Jonah? I'm asking anybody. Oh, <laughs> so... So I think the, this is actually the, uh, the, the intertuberous groove over here. What's happened, we've had chronic so, uh, uh, perching and subluxation of the long head of the biceps, and this is a, a, uh, an acquired remodeling of the humeral head due to the abnormal position of the biceps. I would call that uh, chronic dislocation of the biceps. Fine. I, I wouldn't disagree with that. Yeah. Um, do you see any specific lesion of the cartilage with the bicep sublux uh, subluxating? So, so the cartilage, so, so, so the articular cartilage is way oh, over yeah. here. Yeah, I mean on the bone. Sorry, on the, on the bone. Yeah. yeah. You mean the the cortical part of the bone? Yeah, because like, you can't see it yeah. dynamically. Yeah. Uh, generally, is, is what I found is we we see remodeling over here in the region of the intertuberous groove. Mm -hmm. uh, once the, the, the tendon actually gets dislocated into the subscapularis tendon, I don't think it contacts the, the, the forces are in this direction. Yeah. And I think the forces are along the bone here, not into the bone. Right. So typically it's what we'll see are changes from the, the tearing of the subscap tendon to the it's insertion on the lesser tuberosity. So you can kind of see whiskering along here, but I think that's due to the injury to the subscapularis tendon, I think the biceps tendon typically, once it lodges here uh, and stays there, it'll tend to cut its way through the deep fibers and just end up in the joint space, which we'll see in a minute. Yeah. So, so I don't think the biceps tendon itself affects the cortical bone of the, sub, of the lesser tuberosity bunch. I'm sorry, John? Yes. Uh, do, do you have any uh, uh, photos of um, uh, these shoulders with a chronic dislocation as regards to the glenohumeral ligament, the superior glenohumeral ligament, the sling. Uh, you what mean, happens to the sling in, in, in cases I, like this? I think I do here in a minute. Okay. If, if not, if we go back to that sagittal image that I saw, 
showed before where we had increased signal intensity and irregularity of the subscapular of the superior glenohumeral ligament, what happens at this stage is that the superior glenohumeral ligament is completely torn, and you don't see it. Uh, that, that's what I would think. Uh, that's why I brought it up. Yeah, and let's, let's see in a minute. I may not specifically show that because sometimes it's hard to show the absence of something. But uh, 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 that's for sure. Yeah. So, oops, I went the wrong direction. So, so here's subscription, and uh, this is just fluid in the subdeltoid burst. So this patient also had a cuff tear. So this is more of a chronic grade one. Okay. Uh, let's see. Now, Max, what do you think of this case? Okay, so, well, actually, I don't see the bias intertuberous groove here very well. It must yeah. be flattened. Yeah, we're just, um, we're just a little bit distal to it. it okay. Right in this location, right? Here. So I don't see a normal morphology or signal within the tendon, which is thinned out. So I'm presuming so there's some tear. The uh, actually, this is the tendon right here. Oh, I see. So it's actually thickened. Taken distally, but okay, so that would be a dislocated tendon, right. biceps tendon, um, long head to biceps tendon. So, this is kind of the next kind of stage in the, in the pathophysiology where you have a dislocated tendon that now stays in the subscapularis tendon. And I think this is a, a not a long life stage, I think it's pretty unusual to catch it in this location. and. I can remember the first day we saw one of these in about 1989, it actually clarified everything and it was kind of like a light bulb going off. Uh, but this is where the, the biceps tendon has now dislocated into that interstitial tear in the subscapularis, but it hasn't yet cut itself through the deep fibers and ended up in the joint space. And I like to call this a, a, a grade two MR. Uh, this would be a Habermeyer three. Uh, and then uh, here's a, let's see, a, a, Jeff, what do you think of this case? Okay, so uh, so it's low field technique, and we have a see a T1 uh, axial, T2 axial images, and so what we see is now that the uh, uh, long-headed biceps tendon has apparently cut through the subscapularis uh, entirely, and now resides in the uh, joint space itself within the capsule. So we can see there's nothing here in the intertuberous groove, and now we have the biceps in it. And on one cut, you know, this could be all kinds of things. But obviously, if you have all the images, you follow it from uh, distally, where it comes from the biceps muscle, up to where it attaches to the superior glenoid. And uh, so you can, it's uh, clear to uh, realize when you have all the images that this is the dislocated biceps tendon, and it's deep to the subscapularis tendon in this location. So we saw this early on. Uh, it wasn't till a little bit later that we actually caught the the, the uh, tendon in the process of, of moving into the joint space, which helped clarify it. So this would be a type three. Uh, uh, and here's another one. This is these are early uh, uh, images back from 18, 1980s. Uh, uh, this is the quality of 1.5 Tesla imaging in those days. So we've come a long way. But here you can see the displaced. Uh, tendon and here it's it's kind of nice and now in retrospect what we can see is that there's a very thin but intact subscapularis tendon uh, the bi this is the, actually the more superficial fibers the biceps has come through here cut through the deep fibers and it ended up in the joint space and so we can see in particular so uh, uh, let's see Jeff, you just did the one of recent. Did yeah, I did the last one. You did the last one. Happy so, uh, Jonah, why don't you take this one? What are you seeing? Okay, so we've got uh, axial and coronal images of this uh, patient, and uh, you know we see flattening and uh, dislocation of the uh, biceps tendon there with uh, some tearing as well. Yeah, that little hyper intense signal there, um, and there's definitely irregularity of uh, subscap to go with it. Yeah, just sort of throughout. Um, so what's this? So that's uh, empty uh, groove there. Okay. So, so what we have here, this is the intertuberous groove, but if you notice the morphology is a little bit odd. It's very kind of flattened here because this is a chronic dislocation and you've had remodeling of the bone. But in this particular case, the biceps has dislocated anterior to the subscapularis tendon. 
So this was one that would be typically involved with a partial tear of the supraspinatus insertion uh, if you go along with Habermeyer's classification. Uh, but we, here we can see that there's a complete tear of the transverse ligament across here and a superficial dislocation of the biceps, which, as I said before, is about 20% of dislocated biceps. Uh, uh, John? Yes. Uh, most mo most uh, cases like this um, also have other pathology. This, this usually is not just a single pathologic condition. Right. Uh, yep. <laughs> yep. I agree. I just bring that up. Yep. Okay. Uh, Dashali, what do you think of this? So axial T1 and PD fat set images, 58-year-old female with pain and limited range of motion. I wait for cuff tear. So the lung head biceps tendon has been dislocated from its groove, and it is sitting superficial to the subscapularis tendon bristle fibers. Yeah. And there's uh, fluid. Um, okay. So I know we see a lot of fluid here. And what space would this be? Um, looks like the... Uh, subcoracoid yeah, what bursa, or subdeltoid bursa. 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 So this patient probably has a rotator cuff tear somewhere else. And then we can also see there's a lot of tendinosis with thickening of the subscap, but it's intact. But again, this would be, be another type 4 dislocation. Okay, uh, Max, what do you think of this case? So 27 year old female professional volume play with shoulder pain. Um, so I see two low signal intensity structures in the region of the uh, biceps groove and a lot of fluid surrounding it. I presume that's a torn uh, biceps with uh, basically cinemas. Yeah. So uh, notice how smooth the margins are. And the key thing here, these structures here are called the vinculus. And that's, that's a... Uh, uh, fibrous connection between the, uh, which has synovium on it, uh, between the margins of the, uh, of the uh, sheath and the tendon, and they actually have nutrient vessels in them. The fact that we see two vincula lets us know that this is a congenital bifid bi biceps. Uh, they're, they're quite rare, uh, but this, uh, if we saw a two black structures here and only one vincula, then I'd be concerned about a longitudinal tear. But if you see a longitudinal tear, you usually have abnormal signal intensity within the tendon, and the, the, the tendons aren't nice and round like we see here. They'd be very irregular. So this is actually a congenitally bi bifid uh, long head of the biceps tendon. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jeff, what do you think of this case? Uh, okay, so we've uh, T2 axial image, uh, and uh, so uh, what we're seeing here is, uh, I would say, two hypointense uh, structures, uh, one of which appears to be within the intertubular groove, and the other seems to be perched. Um, now, this could represent, uh, as we described, a bifid tendon, uh, could alternatively represent a split tear of the biceps. Um, how are okay. Subluxation consistent with a modified Bennett type four biceps instability. So clearly, we see that there's a subluxation in one of these components, and we're also seeing some abnormality of the transverse ligament here uh, in, in this particular case. So it's uh, likely that this is symptomatic, probably because you have tearing of the uh, the subscap fibers coming there. Uh, if we followed it, there's we can see it here. There's subluxation superficial to the long head of the uh, to the subscapularis tendon. If we followed it, if we go on the sagittal images, we can see kind of a cleavage plane along the course of the biceps. See kind of two fibers. And as what this, the, whoops. Uh, this is just distally in this congenital uh, biceps case. I'm sorry, this is the same case. Whoops, let me make sure. I don't think so. I'm sorry. No, the, uh, the, this is uh, a, a, a situation where we have a, bifid uh, uh, long head of the biceps tendon where the more anterior component is actually subluxing uh, out of the joint space and this was a symptomatic lesion. So, What's the modified Benetite for? 
uh, uh, that's probably a, a, a long to do note there, wouldn't you think, John? Oops, that's wrong. Well, not not this. Uh, that this one, yeah. A bicep does split that, that periodically. It does, right. These are nice and oval, and they're nice and dark, and I think we're seeing two vincula here. So I don't think I actually got surgical proof on this particular case, uh, but I thought because of that that this was a congenital bifid where one of the uh, bifid complexes is actually subluxing anteriorly. Uh, the reason I bring that up is because the uh, bicepital groove is so deep. Yeah. And, and, and I would think, because uh, uh, split biceps is not that uh, they're, they're, Oh, the, the tears are pretty common, right? Oh. Yeah. I, uh, I, I really don't know. I'm just sad. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, a Bennett type 4 biceps instability is one where the, the tendon uh, uh, subluxes uh, superficially here. Okay, uh, let's see, who's next? Yeah. Shall I? Yeah. Do you have an axial PD fat saturated image where the, there's a oval low signal intensity structure, long head biceps tendon that's been dislocated and subluxed the anterior to the glenoid, and there's full thickness subscapularis tear? Yeah. So there's a subscap tear and biceps dislocation, uh, and this uh, really it was a full thickness tear here, not partial thickness like, like we saw before, and this uh, would be a type 5 where we have an anterior dislocation into the joint space, but a complete tear with proximal retraction of the subscapularis tendon. And this is also chronic, we can see remodeling of the intertuberous groove region. Uh, okay, uh, Jeff, what do you think of this case? Uh, 81-year-old female was injured while throwing a ball, uh, and so we have the axial T1 and T2 images. Uh, so in this case, it looks like that the uh, long-head device's tendon uh, has dislocated. Uh, there is extensive uh, you know, uh, joint effusion synovitis, and uh, I see the subscapularis tendon it appears to be torn and retracted. Uh, so uh, I'd say, so, and the uh, and the uh, um, uh, long handed bicep tendon is uh, just into the uh, the joint space. Uh, so you know we have at least a tear of the complete tear of the sub of the subscapularis, and I'm wondering there might also be a complete tear of the uh, supraspinatus as well. Well, we uh, don't really see the supraspinatus here. Yeah, we don't. But this is uh, another type five where you have a dislocation of the yeah. bicep tendon into the joint space, complete tear of the subscapularis, and uh, now, this was a grandmother who was trying to, uh, uh, to entertain her grandsons when they came over for a visit. And uh, she went out to play ball with them and ended up uh, uh, in surgery. So that triangle-shaped structure anterior to the glenoid looks like the, the medial side has like a low signal peripheral rim and the, the lateral side it's like flattened. So it almost looks like a piece of bone that was ripped off instead of like a tendon? Yeah, but if you, if you follow it up and down, it inserts in the superior glenoid notch and extends down distally to the biceps muscle. So I know on, on one cut, I agree with you, but, but if you looked at all the images, it's the biceps tendon. Uh, it doesn't look like she has much of a groove there, does she? Uh, I think we're too low, John. I think we're oh, okay. down near the neck of the humerus on this cut. Here are the coronal uh, images. Yeah, I was thinking about that uh, being too low, and but yeah. I don't know. Yeah, and we don't really see the inner tubus groove well here. It'd probably be over here. But this is the biceps tendon displaced medially into the joint space here. Oh, no doubt about that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jeff, you did the last one. Jo Jonah, what do you think of this one? Sure. This is a 28-year-old male with uh, shoulder pain after a uh, motorcycle now, let me accident. Show you, so. let, me sh let me show you a couple of images. This is one image. Okay. okay, there's one image. This is the next image. This is the next image. We're going up higher. Yeah. 
Here's the next image. We're going up higher still. And then there's nice. that image. Well, this looks like a pretty severe injury. It looks like uh, he actually uh, dislocated his uh, biceps tendon uh, posteriorly. Right. And then you can see the inner tuberous groove. There's nothing there. This is a very rare lesion. Uh, and I kind of call this a grade six posterior dislocation. I think there are only three or four in the medical literature that have been reported. But this is a posterior dislocation uh, in this particular case. So very rare lesion, but uh, it's one of the possible dislocations. Okay. Uh, let's see, Dishali. In the axial uh, GRE fluid sensitive and an axial T2 lower in the arm and sagittal T2. And there's a signal void of the uh, within the uh, inner tuberous groove. So there's no tendon there. And then if we look on the axial images, there's tendon retraction with fluid around it. And then you can see the uh, waving a waved appearance of the retracted, torn, long head biceps tendon. So it's been torn from its uh, insertion and it's retracted proximally. Uh, why do you say it's torn from insertion? Oh, I'm sorry, from its origin um, proximally and it's retracted distally. Well, it doesn't have to be from the um, origin. It may be uh, from the biceptal groove um, or, or above, or maybe even uh, probably not below, but uh, any, any place around the groove. Yeah, this can be from the origin, or there's a, also a weak area that's about a centimeter out uh, in, the inner, in the biceps tendon, about a centimeter from the actual insertion on the superior glenoid, which can tear also, and you can be left with a stub which sometimes can be floating in the joint space and cause intermittent symptoms. So whenever you see this, you have to look for that. Because that may be surgical. If this, patient, if this patient is between 20 and 30 years of age or in that vicinity, uh, you certainly wouldn't want to tell the surgeon how far it is. Uh, because to do surgery in this, you're, you have to do a lot of uh, looking. And, and, and you don't want to be doing a lot of cutting. Okay. Yep. Uh, and then, uh, so, so the, the muscle tends to displace distally here, and so you get a large, uh, uh, you get a deformity uh, in, the, in the arms. What's that inf or a deformity called, you know? It, it has a misnomer. It's called a Popeye arm. Uh, but but actually, Papa had big forearms, not big biceps. So I don't know where it gets that name. I guess somebody didn't watch comics right. Uh, but you only, only if he ate spinach, John. Yeah, right, only if he ate spinach. Uh, so uh, so John, uh, what would be your indications to do surgery on this? Uh, I requested a patient at age. Usually, you don't do any surgery above the age of thirty. Okay. And then, yeah, but and then now, now, age of fifty is kind of you know, kind of young. It's getting younger all the time as I grow older. Okay, and then it's primarily for for uh, cosmetics, isn't it? Yes, it is. Uh, well, you may improve the function a little bit, but not that much. Uh, mainly, you're worried about supination. Uh, you can lose about five to percent of supination. Uh, usually, initially, you you have quite a bit of weakness. But that recovers. So, in a, in a, a year or two, you you'll probably only lose about five to ten percent. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right. So, do you attach it to the proximal humeral shaft? Uh, the biceps gives about twenty percent of flexion, um, in terms of strength. So, it's, so where it's do you where do you important. attach the tendon on this case? John, where do you do the tenodesis when you do this? Uh, in the bicepital groove. Yeah, I, I've seen it everywhere from the, around the bicepital groove to Easier. more distally sometimes. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the proximal tears like this one, uh, if this is like a patient in, in, in their 20s or whatever and they want the surgery, um, uh, there, there are some interesting devices to use uh, to fix um, uh, the tendon to bone. You can actually uh, use the interferential screws that are hollow 
and uh, also sutures. You do a whip stitch um, on a tendon and then pull it to one, one, one end of the tendon through the um, a hollow a screw and then uh, push the tendon uh, with a whip stitch about five or six uh, 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 suture um, segments into the hollow in a humerus about eight, 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 uh, eight millimeters uh, in size and then uh, put a screw in and tie the sutures over the top of the screw at the level of the bone. And it works pretty good. It's a fast procedure. It can be done, it can be done arthroscopically. Um, it probably may be easier to do though uh, with a small incision. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't. I've never used a, uh, this kind of a device before. Okay. Thank you. I, I've always done them open, but not that, not that many because uh, it's pretty rare to see a young person have a rupture like this. I think this is an older person. Yeah, I'm sure it's over 50. So that would be kind of the type 7, uh, complete rupture and dislocation. Uh, which, which means slightly older, you know. <laughs> right, right. See who's next? I forgot. Who? The last one. Yeah, Max? So we have three images. Uh, the, all the three are, I think, T2 signal, uh, yeah, T2 weighted image. No field, scanner, no field right? Yeah, I think. T2. T2. So we got an empty uh, bicep row groove, uh, and then we have all this edema uh, and retraction of the muscle within the, uh, I believe that's the upper arm. So that looks like basically um, uh, must be a bicep tendon tear and, um, and hematoma within the arm. So uh, one thing that you can get when you have these acute tears is uh, depending upon the vessels which are injured, you can get large hematomas as well, which uh, need to be described. And this is this is all hematoma formation here, and that's the displaced uh, biceps muscle down here. And here we can see a, nothing in the groove, biceps tear. Here we can see the proximal stub is intact. The tear occurred right about here. Um, no, I guess it's more distal than that. So there's a, the, we can see a complete rupture here. Here we can see the biceps tendon attachment to the superior glenoid. And if we follow it down in the uh, bicipital groove, we can actually see that part of the tendon actually goes into the bicipital groove. So this was a tear, as John was talking about, uh, that's in the bicipital groove. And the, the issue with, with these, and I think I have an example somewhere, uh, is that the this can displace into the glenohumeral joint and produce intermittent symptoms of uh, like like a loose body. So sometimes that that may have to be addressed surgically uh, if the patient. Yeah, you ex you excise the proximal end. Yeah. And you and you did the tenodes the distal end yeah. by removing about 20 millimeters of uh, the tendon because it's too long to put into the bone. Yeah. Uh, otherwise. Yeah. So this is a fairly rare location of the tear but it's an important one to describe in the report if you see it, so you have to look for it. Okay, uh, Jeff, what do you think of this case? A uh, 53-year-old female with pain and decreased range of motion, and we have a, looks like a, a PD fat at uh, I think actually, a T2, T2. T2. Both, both field. Uh, T2, uh, the sagittal uh, image of the shoulder and in the area of the uh, let's see here. Uh, I mean, it looks like it. Hmm. So I'm looking here is the uh, biceps pulley, and uh, it looks like the uh, 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 sphere of ligament. I think is uh, I think is ruptured there. I mean, it is a hyper intense signal in, what, in the area. I would expect that uh, location. Um, yeah. So so uh, yeah yeah the super glenohumeral ligament. We talked about its anatomy before. It's going to be coming off right in through here, but we're here we're really at the level of the superior glenoid. Uh, and this okay. Looks, what's this big thing back here? Oh, that's true. Uh, <laughs> so we're seeing something that's uh, sitting, essentially a sitting uh, structure, low intense structure. Uh, uh, it's uh, deep to the supraspinatus, superficial to the glenoid. Um, 
and we're seeing okay. So on this uh, so on this T uh, two uh, coronal image, it looks like a uh, uh, bicep st stump of the superior labral complex. Yeah, and that we can see that. Forget the partial tear of the supraspinatus. We see no real tendon in the biceps. Just this little, uh, uh, probably result an old vincula that's that's left there. Uh, so that's that's the stub. So, well, so this is a bicep tear with a large stub uh, back. That uh, uh, in this case, uh, I think they did go in and resect the stub, and they did a tenodesis of the distal tendon. Okay. Uh, uh, Jonah, what do you think of this case? Right, so we've got, say, a single sagittal, uh, I think, T2 image. Um, and I'm seeing some fluid signal around uh, the uh, biceps tendon. Wait, wait, here's, here's the biceps tendon here, right? Yeah, well, it's more intermediate. It's, it's, yeah. it's insertion on the superior glenoid. Uh, this is the area of the rotator cuff interval, which should be full of fat, right? But but here we're seeing that the fat's replaced by fibrous tissue uh, around in this location. Uh, so the, the other thing that can occur and produce symptoms in this area is scar uh, in the in the interval, which typically is associated with symptoms of frozen shoulder. But this scar can also attach to the biceps, and you can get symptoms of biceps uh, uh, pain as well probably because you can injure with scarring attached to the biceps tendon when you put strain on the biceps tendon uh, that can increase the, the symptoms associated with the frozen shoulder. So, so this is uh, uh, occasionally look, look also for uh, scarring in the rotator cuff interval which may be affecting the biceps. Uh, one thing I'll, I'll mention is the biceps is an extremely uh, sensitive uh, tendon. Um, as you know, it's covered by a synovial membrane, and um, there are a lot of um, nerve fibers going in there, and, and, and they're very, very sensitive area. Um, if you feel your own shoulder uh, anteriorly, um, the deltoid doesn't uh, cause any pain, but, but try to find where the biceps goes back and forth, and you'll find that that, that area is quite sensitive. Thanks, John. Okay, uh, so not, uh, Shali. So we have two axial T1 weighted images and a sagittal T2 weighted image. And there's suture anchors within the uh, humerus from prior, I presume, rotator cuff repair versus could this be from a tenodesis? Um, so this really isn't the right location for for supraspinatus anyway. Maybe a subscap. Getting close to the yeah. biceps in it. And if we look here, uh, this is actually, you can't see it really well here on these low field scanners, but this is the biceps tendon coming up to the, uh, the suture. So it's from Matinodesis. So as John said, one location of these is near the I, I can't hear you, John. So as, as John said before, one of the locations where you can do the tenodesis is uh, near the intertuberous groove. And this is a, a tenodesis of the long head of the biceps tendon, and this is the, uh, uh, the uh, suture anchor. Uh, yeah, that's a little high, by the way. Yeah. It's, high, it's uh, higher than, than we normally see it. Or, or, you, you, or you want to be as, um, uh, in the interval between a supraspinatus tendon attachment uh, and uh, and and uh, uh, subscapularis, right in that area um, in the bicepital groove. Uh, in other words, little distal uh, to this. Uh, uh, just distal to that area. Yeah. Here's a subscap coming in. Okay, uh, Max, what do you think of this one? So here all the biceps tendon tenodesis with interference screw two weeks ago. Patient felt three days ago rule out biceps rupture. Okay, so let's see. Well, we see a low signal intensity of tubular structure medial uh, in at the glenohumeral right. joint, right? So it looks like the by, uh, by the tendon is not no longer there. So, and then there's an area of. I think this is just part of the subscap. Oh, is it? Okay. okay so this so, is the area that tenodesis here. So, the, so it looks the like structure there. maybe it's uh, uh, fragmented and torn. Yeah. So yeah. we're going to do an oblique uh, sagittal image mm -hmm. right through that area. See it better. And this is what we see when we do that. 
Oh, actually, it looks intact. It looks still. No, that's a much better area. Right. So, a couple things to point out here is you can follow these. You'd have to really follow the axles up and down. Mm -hmm. uh, but getting a nice, oblique uh, plane image can be very helpful in evaluating these. And when you do that here, you can see that the actual uh, construct is still intact. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. Uh, uh, that, uh, that screw is not deep enough. That's one of the problems. Yeah, well, yeah. here's the cortex. The cortex line is probably through here. We're just seeing some signal changes within the cortex, but it could be. But, uh, yeah. it, it should either be level with the cortex or a little uh, below the cortex. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think the cortex probably goes somewhere here. And we're probably getting a little bit of lysis. Oh uh, yeah, but th th this is not interference screw. Uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, uh, an anchor. An anchor. An anchor. You have to go deeper. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, okay. Jeff, what do you think of this case? A uh, 77 year old male with shoulder pain, and we have axial. Uh, Looks like T2 images, uh, actually, you know, PD fat side images. Uh, so uh, in this case, uh, what we're seeing is uh, essentially in the, well, first of all, the groove itself is uh, somewhat shallow, maybe remodeled, and uh, there is a structure, uh, kind of a uh, crescent-shaped structure uh, in the groove. Uh, with, actually, it's within the, uh, the biceps tendon sheath, it looks like. And uh, and adjacent to it is the uh, biceps tendon itself, and it, uh, it looks to me it has the same signal uh, intensity as the surrounding marrow, so it's maybe like a heterotopic ossification uh, within the sheath itself, and uh, it actually has a somewhat uh, uh, concave appearance to it, uh, suggesting that it's probably uh, maybe re being remodeled by the long the, the biceps tendon. Right. Good. And here we can see the, the coronal images through this uh, same ossicle. So it's a loose body within the biceps tendon sheath. And it's been there a long time. If we go back, we can actually see that we're, we're distal to the inner tuberous groove or the, the bicepital groove. Uh, what we, so distally here, this is actually chronic remodeling due to the presence of this uh, loose body. And as you said, uh, we have remodeling here where the tendon goes through. So this is a, a longstanding uh, loose body within the... Uh, Bicep sheath, bicep tendon sheath. Good. Uh, Noah, what do you, uh, Jonah, what do you think of this? Sure, so we got a couple of uh, radiographs of this uh, patient's shoulder here. Um, you know, on the uh, on the right, I'm seeing some kind of vague opacity, kind of uh, adjacent to the humeral head, maybe projectional. Okay, so now we've got MR. Uh, this okay so 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 basically uh, the soft tissues look pretty good here we're seeing a little bit of overlying soft tissue here but that's a kind of a non-specific thing we don't really see any soft tissue calcifications but here's the MR the MR study okay so yeah I guess that's the area we were seeing then so we have this uh, uh material uh, mostly low signal intensity but with some uh, hyper intense areas as well um, yeah, here we have some other Shots at it, um, yeah. So it has sort of an chronic uh, inflammatory kind of appearance. I might query something like um, okay. well, maybe some chondromatosis or some chronic okay. body. Yeah. So so That's this is synovial chondromatosis within the biceps ten uh, uh, tendon sheath, and it's been here a long time because you're actually seeing deformity of the tendon sheath. Uh, this is probably the tendon over here, and these are all loose bodies, uh, uh, which are uh, from synovial chondromatosis. And if we go back, the plain films, we really don't see calcification here, so these are these are all cartilaginous bodies. Okay. I'm a 40-year-old female with anterior shoulder pain after working out. So we have two axial T2-weighted images. And there's a irregularity on the first image. There's a irregularity to the posterior aspect of the humeral head, um, and then there's also um, 
further down, more inferiorly, um, a larger area um, of irregularity along the uh, infraspinatus so insertion. Traction injury back here, but that's not what her symptoms are. Yeah, no. Um, there's also um, this intermediate to high signal intensity collection anterior to the subscapularis tendon, which looks like it communicates with the um, biceps tendon sheath. Uh, and then on stir imaging, coronal images, the, it's hyper intense. So with the yeah, speckled appearance. So again, synovial chondromatosis can have this appearance. Uh, so, sheets surrounding by debris. Uh, this so, we got two um, coronal um, fat set and non, actually, that's T1 and T2 se sequences. Uh, we have. Um, Oh, PD facet, okay. So, we have uh, a lot of fluid. Okay. A lot of fluid. Uh, I think that's within the, ten within the tendon itself. Distending the tendon, I think. In, in this, or is it surrounding the tendon? Maybe the tendon. So, th thin that tendon with fluid around it. Um, well, that looks like it's within the tendon. So, could that be a, a intratendon assist? Very good. Okay. Uh, Jeff, what do you think of this case? Okay, chest pain rule out pectoralis tear, and we have a, a T T one. Uh, or T1 image. So uh, what we're seeing here is the uh, uh, pectoralis muscle, and then uh, just on the very edge of the periphery of the image, uh, I see the uh, humerus. And I see this uh, hypo-intense uh, linear structure extending uh, from it. And uh, that, I believe, is the uh, pectoralis uh, tendon. And it looks like it's intact at its insertion. Uh, what at its insertion? Intact. I think it's intact at its, intact, yeah. Yeah, at its insertion. I'm always amazed at how thin this tendon is. It, the reason mm -hmm. it's strong is because it's, it's, lo it's, uh, it's long. It, it, its insertion is a rather long insertion. But the tendon mm -hmm. itself is very thin here. Uh, so this is a T1-weighted image. Uh, now, we'll see in a minute that this is actually abnormal morphology of the, of the pectoralis tendon, I mean the pectoralis muscle. This patient is very well developed, obviously a weightlifter. So there's the tendon. Uh, this is what the PD fat set images look like. Okay, uh, so the PD fat set images, uh, we see uh, essentially a large defect anteriorly within the pectoralis muscle with uh, surrounding edema and hemorrhage. Uh, so there's actually, a, a, looks like a, essentially probably very close to you know, full thickness tear of the uh, pectoralis muscle, uh, but the muscle belly itself, uh, although the tendon is, is intact. So, so as you're alluding to there, the really important thing here is to determine where the tear occurs. In this case, the tear is completely within the muscle belly. In this case, and I agree with you, it's a basically essentially a complete tear. Uh, the tendon itself is intact here, and that's important because the tendon can be a surgical lesion, whereas the muscle belly tears are, are non-surgical type lesions. And here are the sagittal images showing the tear going into the uh, uh, belly of the of the uh, pectoralis uh, muscle. And here are the coronal images showing the tear. But, the, but this is a tear within the muscle itself, and the treatment really is conservative. Was it a football injury, you think? Cause, I mean, uh, this, was was a weight, this was a weightlifting. This was a bench press injury. Uh, uh, they're going to need a prosthesis to make him look uh, uh, muscular. <laughs> uh, Jonah, what do you think of this case? Okay, so we're ruling out a pectoralis tear. We've got an axial and a sagittal image. Um, and, yeah, it looks like on um, the axial image we're seeing uh, some irregularity of the uh, tech tendon itself, perhaps, if that's where we are, yeah, and uh, then so, yeah, it looks like so, perhaps even... Mm -hmm. So these are low-field images. So uh, what's the pathology here? 
So I'm concerned that this is a tear of the uh, pectoral tendon here. Since you're talking about the pectoralis, that's a good good choice. Where is the tear? Yeah, but uh, yeah, tendon is a previous muscle. So yeah. here's the pectoralis muscle end. Here's the muscular tendon's junction. There's the tendon, and it should be straight going over the biceps and attaching over here. So here we can see this is a tear of the tendon off the bone. And other images showed that the uh, muscle belly was intact. Uh, so this is really a tear at the tendon bone junction, uh, which in this particular case was a surgical uh, lesion and was operated. That can be fixed and uh, unfortunately, but it's a long immobilization time. It's about, about six weeks uh, with the arm to the side. Yeah. And then a very slow recovery time, okay. about, nine, about six months. Uh, which uh, athletes and weightlifters don't like. Yeah, so you, you have to do it more. You know, you tell them like it's nine months and then yes. six months go by and then, then, then you take an MRI and say, Oh, gee, it's really much improved. Uh, we let you go from the sling. <laughs> you, you have to lie sometimes to people. I'm, I'm serious. Oh, John, you, did, you would never do that, would you? <laughs> oh, my nose grows all the time when I do that. <laughs> okay. Uh, shall we? 16-year-old American football player with chest pain after a block. And these are axial T1-weighted images. And um, so you see the humeral diaphysis, and there's a low signal intensity stump there. And then there's a gap at which there's increased T1 signal intensity um, and the proximal, as uh, yeah, the proximal aspect of the pectoralis major muscle. So there's a myotendinous tear with hematoma. Okay. So, so this is a muscular tendon junction tear. So this isn't in the muscle. It's not just the tendon. It's at the musculotendinous junction. And here are the axial images where we can see that separation uh, in this particular patient on the, P, on the uh, PD fat sat. Uh, this is a stir sequence where we can see that tear and retraction. There's just a little stub of tendon on the muscle. And looking for that is, is important. Because uh, <laughs> if there's no tendon attachment to the muscle, then generally people are loath to do surgery. Uh, but if there is some tendon left onto the muscle, then uh, some people will, will, op will consider these an intratendinous tear and will consider surgery. And this patient actually uh, went to surgery. Uh, John, what do you think of that? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's certainly doable. He's 16 years old. He's uh, supple. Uh, so uh, it, it, it's a good reason to go for it. Yeah. So, so finding this little nubbin of tendon uh, is important. I've seen a few of these where there was no nubbin, where they also operated on them. But uh, just no nubbin, get it. Uh, it's not going to work. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember the outcome of those. But when you see the tendon, a uh, little bit of tendon here, uh, then this patient is a much better surgical candidate. So it's important to describe that uh, in the report. And you have to look for it. Sometimes it can be subtle. Uh, and then here's just an old tear uh, where we can see some fatty replacement. There's some fluid around it on the T2, but there's fat in the area of the tear, which indicates that it's a, a chronic tear with a little bit of fluid around it. And here we can see that this was a, we can see fluid separating the, the muscle here, but this was an old uh, tear which involved the, the, the muscle and with some deformity left over. Yeah, I, I suspect maybe some stem cell uh, treatments have been tried in this, but I, I really don't know. Yeah. Because that's yeah. Such, a, such a new field, I'm, I'm not sure. You can get the stem cells from the abdomen and then uh, spin them down and inject them. Yeah, I don't know the literature. I'm sure it's been tried. I would be shocked if there were any good studies to show efficacy. I haven't read any, but... Uh, I, it's certainly an, a good idea to try, I would think, yeah. in an acute phase. Right. Uh, let's see. We're, we're out of time. Why don't we stop here? I think we just have a few things to finish up uh, in this area uh, tomorrow, and then we'll go on to, uh, to the next topic. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.
Thank you, Chris. Have a good one. Hey, John. Yes. How about 